So I'm just sitting here talking with uh, Bill Briggs after he made me a belt, and we're talking about his family, and his grandfather came up here from Wyoming. Four brothers? Yep. Four brothers, and they ended up near Lima, Montana, ended up owning uh, 100,000 acres deeded ground and another operating another 140,000 acres of uh, lease ground, right? And they sold it in 70... 79. So 1979, they sold that whole place. I can't imagine what 100,000 acre ranch with 140,000 acres of lease ground would be right now. But he was, he, we were talking about the prices of everything going up from way back when, from 1940s and 1950s and stuff, to now. And one of the reasons that ranching and farming has to be so vast anymore. It has to have a lot more acres to make anywhere near the same amount of money. And you, and you can't because uh, he was talking about, you were saying, was it, who was it that had that? So the person that originally came to this ranch that his family eventually bought. Henry Thompson. Henry Thompson. Bought a house out of a, a house kit out of a Sears and Roebuck catalog. And it's, it's a stone, it looks like a stone house. I'll try to show it to you yeah. on my way back home. Yeah. For eight thousand bucks. Eight thousand bucks for the kit. Which which was an astronomical amount back then in nineteen whenever he did it. Nineteen hundred. Well, no, I'm sorry, about nineteen oh five roughly is when he would have bought the kit. About nineteen oh five. So that that's a, a huge amount of money back then. And and that's because it's huge, three stories high and everything. But Okay, so tell me about the calves. The calf prices last year, you were saying. Yeah, so we when we sold the family ranch in 79, the, the calves that fall brought a dollar a pound for the first time in the history of our family. You know, cattle prices just gradually increased over the course of 30 years or whatever and finally peaked at a dollar a pound. And I was saying last year, last fall, we sold our calves for about $1.42 a pound. So we picked up 40 cents a pound in that period of time from 79, what would that be, maybe 44 years roughly. Yeah, right? 40, 45 roughly. years, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, that same year, we bought a brand new Ford pickup for $8,000. Right. Right? Right. And my brother was born, and the one that you were just with, and my dad sold a horse, and paid the hospital and the doctor bill for less than five hundred dollars. Wow! To to have a baby born, combined total. Now, what would it cost today if you were to pull the cash out of your pocket and pay the hospital, the doctor, you know, maybe all the specialists, everything involved? Could be forty thousand dollars today. I don't know. Yeah, but for the for the having a baby. Yeah, to have a baby. Well, back when when uh, we had our first kid, it was about. I think out of pocket, it was about 9500 or something. Yeah. And that was almost 20 years ago. So, right. I mean, yeah, it's got to be 25, 30 grand now, I suppose. Plus the pickup. Yeah. I mean, the pickup. So, we're talking a pickup cost it how much? That same truck today you could buy for 50000 You think so? Comparable. Yeah, because it wasn't, it wasn't real fancy. You know, it was a Ford Custom. So it didn't have all the bells and whistles, but it was $8,000. So I'd say you can buy, you know, a pretty plain Jane Ford truck now for maybe 50000 of them. You yeah, know. maybe. So we picked up Maybe. That's a pretty cheap one. <laughs> yes, we picked up. So what the, what we're talking about is is over the, the same course of time, the price of cattle has gone up $0.40 cents per pound. But the price of a vehicle, because I remember my dad, when I was... In 77, he bought a new Chevy pickup for 3500 bucks, And it had all the bells and whistles. It had to, you know, back then, all the bells and whistles was like lights over the cab, right. you know, and an extra knob on your dash, you know, kind of a thing. It wasn't right. like, there wasn't a lot of extras you could get. Sliding rear window was a big one. So that was, and, and that's like 3500 bucks. So nowadays, a new Chevy pickup is like, Somewhere between seventy and one hundred and ten, one hundred fifteen thousand dollars, and I'm not kidding. With all the bells, with all the bells and whistles, they're they're ridiculous. So that is way out of proportion. Exactly. You know, way out of proportion for what you could sell your calves for versus what your expenses are. The things you have to buy have gone up astronomically more than. So yeah. people say, well, 
beef is expensive. Actually, it's not. It's way cheaper. Right. In comparison, way cheaper in the store. Relatively speaking. Relative to what they they would have had to spend back then, uh, compared to what you made, and the rest of your living expenses would have been way higher yeah. for beef. So back in 79, a 500-pound calf in the fall, 550, would bring you $550, right? Wow. And a 550-pound calf last fall at $1.40 a pound would be, what, around $800. Mm-hmm. So we've seen maybe a $300 increase in the exact same critter from 79 to 2022. And yet, you know, what is your insurance cost today compared with what it was in 79? I don't think you had insurance back then. <laughs> you didn't even worry about insurance because, you know, the, the hospital bills cost my, I can't remember, my mom's, she's got the receipt for my hospital bills, like 350 bucks, right, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. And then you got fuel. You know, oh, yeah. probably diesel fuel in 79 was maybe 50 bucks a gallon. I take a wild guess. 50 cents a gallon. Or I'm sorry, yeah, 50 cents yeah. a gallon. Now we got, what is it, 450 yeah, four, or? Four 425 or 450, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hundreds of percent more, yet the price of calf only didn't even go up 50%. So yeah. it didn't even, probably 20%. So that that makes it more difficult for people i mean so you can see the the interesting delicate part of the financials of a ranch anymore much more difficult to function as a rancher because the price unless the price is evened out now i think a lot less people would buy beef because beef is going to be more expensive if it it was the same if it was the same proportionate amount but the people who ranch could therefore make a lot more money for what they're raising, which means they could probably afford to keep the land, the family land that they're selling. Because you're, I mean, you think about the fam, this family, they sold, selling the ranch of a hundred thousand acre ranch in 1979. I don't know what they sold it for. You have any idea what they sold it for? Roughly 10 million. 10 million? Roughly. So, I mean, that's, that's sounds like a lot of money right now. Um, Let's say there's, so. There's a ranch that's up by Augusta. This, this twenty thing. years ago sold for forty million, and it wasn't near hundred thousand yeah. acres. <laughs> yeah, I've seen I've seen places comparably, you know, that were roughly the same size and the same uh, combination of livestock and land and you know assets and whatnot priced at eighty to ninety to a hundred million. Actually, now. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So essentially the land cost has gone up 10 times. Right. Yeah. In the same period of time. In the same period of time. And then we wonder how can these young people ever get a start? How could a young couple, you know, that loves ranching and is very passionate about it. Maybe they've been doing it all their lives. Well, I'm living proof. I couldn't afford to get back in it as bad as I wanted to, mm -hmm. you know? So it's it's a pretty rough pull for a young couple that you know wants to try to raise their family and livestock and, and the livestock industry and uh, it's tough. Well, and one of the one of the things that I've been kind of discussing uh, the last few days is that every which which makes makes this problem more exacerbated because there's only so much land. Every, every inch of ground now is being utilized for something. So there's more demand than the amount of ground available. And, and I think one thing that people kind of miss is that every piece of ground, every acre of ground and every blade of grass pretty much has a cost on it. Somebody has to pay every year all the time to maintain it. And that includes public land. Public land is not free. The, the, taxpayers have to pay to maintain public land all the time and part of that money comes from you wonder why they allow leasing ranchers leasing ground a public ground number one that was part of the agreement that's why they set up public ground it was for conservation and to help raise cattle so it was part of the grazing aspect was already written in there at the beginning but part of that, the money that they spend for the leases, even though it's it's not very much nowadays compared to leasing something else, it's still 
part of that money goes to maintaining that property. And they're falling short on that because now you have trouble getting, you know, you see a lot of trails that aren't maintained. You see a lot of ground in the oh, yeah. public that's not maintained. And, and that's because it still costs a lot of money to maintain land. So when you're, when I think a lot of times people look at wild animals versus cattle or wild horses versus cattle and all of those animals are still competing for the same amount of ground. I'm not saying you should eliminate some of them. I'm saying you have to manage the whole thing because as a whole, if you don't, it's it's not like you can you can put more, you can just allow all the wild horses in the world to just keep going. We don't have extra land somewhere to put them on. It's already being utilized. And if you're utilizing that land for food, for humans, by cattle production, right? Um, you don't want to take that land away from cattle production to give it to horses, which only cost taxpayer money. There, there's, uh, you know, people. There's no product value for no wild return. horses. Yeah. No return. People say, "Well, you can ride them." Yeah, the percentage that you can ride of wild horses is very minimal. Uh, the the breeding program of a wild herd is basically whichever the meanest, nastiest stallion wins a herd of mares and breeds them. So as you can, not really good mindset is going to come out of that. Now, some of them are amazing. That's true. Yeah. You do get, you do find some really good mindset horses out of wild herds, but you're going to have a ton of those you can't use for that. So if you don't utilize them for something else, you have a, a creature that's interesting to look at, but that's not producing money anywhere, you know, very little. Right. Trinity, we've got 24 acres here, you know, and it's productive land and it's just pasture land. But uh, we run, we try to run seven mother cows here just to keep our herd mm -hmm. alive. And, you know, we love to go out and walk through them and just work with the genetics and whatever else. But what would happen if we just allowed those eight cows with one bull to live here for the next 20 years? And we didn't do anything to manage them. Mm -hmm. The next thing we knew, we'd have 60. Yeah. Well, 60 head is, 24 acres is not going to carry 60 head. They're going to end up tromping this thing into nothing and eventually starving to death. Exactly. So that's just a fact. That's just a hardcore fact. And in order for us to maintain the integrity of this land and keep the, the grazing where it is and the plants, you know, uh, we know about exactly what the carrying capacity is on this place when you include drought years, you know, and good years and whatever else. And so by managing it, we're able to maintain good, healthy animals and a good lifestyle, but it does require management. Mm -hmm. It requires utilizing the animals that are there. And that's, Correct. people have this emotional problem with doing that because it means killing an animal. But it, it you it you're actually killing something with kindness many times. It, you, the more you save things, the more you kill other things. It's not you're not saving everything. You're killing something. <laughs> you know, if we have a whole bunch of extra ground somewhere that somebody knows about, you know, like there's a whole nother right. world or a country somewhere that doesn't have any animals on it that's growing grass that we could use, you know, then you'd have a while longer. We don't. So even even here, you know, it's the buffalo were here. Right. And we've replaced them with cattle. It's not that so the ground was even being utilized then. It's just being utilized differently now. Yeah, you know one thing I learned of, I don't know if you've encountered this or not, and I'm no scientist, trust me. You know, I'm just I'm just old school, but this really hit me hard. We outfitted and guided in this area quite a bit and became very much aware of how much the buffalo we're in this vicinity, yeah. you know, even up high, even up as high as 7,000 feet in these high mountain valleys. And, uh, you know, I've said to myself, how did the natural world work, you know, in those days, because there's a lot of controversy about grazing and, and everything else. So we were outfitting up in a, in a drainage, really gorgeous place where the buffalo used to come through in the summertime. And people got really concerned about, you know, the cattle that were in there on a federal permit. And so they kicked the cows out. You know, they just wiped them out, took them out of there because they 
said they were destroying the habitat. But anyway, um, I, th I thought to myself, you know, when I'm guiding elk, the elk always followed the cattle. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to find mm -hmm. the elk or the biggest bunches of elk, we'd always either go to the rest pasture that didn't have any cattle in it that particular year or the pasture that the cattle had just been in, one or the mm -hmm. other. That's where the elk wanted to be. And I, you know, I've noticed that my whole life, even when we had our own ranch, we had a lot of elk following our cattle and deer and the whole works. So I got to thinking, why is that? And uh, so my younger brother, Mike, he was running an elk ranch down in Idaho. And it, it'd take me too long to tell you all the ways that he discovered this, but he discovered that elk are what they call a secondary grazer. And the buffalo are a primary grazer. Right. So if you think about the size of a buffalo, you know, and if you ever look at a buffalo tooth, the molars, mm -hmm. they're twice, if not three times the size of an elk. So you got a much bigger animal, much bigger uh, processor as far as, you know, how they're able to, to grind up the grass and whatever else. So in my mind's eye, I thought to myself, these big, huge herds of buffalo come through. And in the natural world, they would just take off the top. You know, they would take the where the protein is, which is in the heads, and, and the best part of the grass is on the top. They'd take the top off. Well, then the elk, they're secondary grazers, and the mule deer and whatever else, they're a more, much more refined animal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They would come along and get that new growth that was coming underneath. And that's what started to make sense. It started clicking for me. Wow primary and secondary grazer because I watched it my whole life mm -hmm. with the cattle especially because cattle will do the same thing as buffalo if give them the opportunity they'll come in and take off the top third and then they just kind of keep moving and the deer and the elk love to come behind them yeah so when I first moved into that drainage it was a pure paradise because there was a good management system you know the forest service had uh, they'd set it up in four different pastures and they would rotate them every year, rest one, you know. And the elk and the deer were just thriving in there. I mean, it was amazing. I was so amazed at the resource that we had when I first got in there. And then they, for whatever their reasons are, which I'll let them tell, uh, they pulled the cattle out and within two years, the elk evaporated. They just, they just left that area run. to go somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. We'd get little tiny bunches of, you know, okay. maybe 20 and 30 would creep in and try to follow their same old patterns. But the grass was, you know, 36 inches high or 40 inches high and really coarse. And they just never came back. And I would stand up there on those big passes on top of the Continental Divide, scratching my head and saying, where's the elk? <laughs> yeah. You know? And which which makes it makes your at that time you were an outfitter so that, that's your living is family. finding those elk and so it, when it's a good example of exactly what we're talking about when you try to help something a lot of times you're trying to help something like oh we're you're destroying this habitat for elk you actually are hurting it by trying to be kind without the knowledge right so many people or or emotion some people just do it with well, it's, it's, I guess it's the same thing because you're you're still not applying logic and knowledge to it in real life. Real life is what I mean by real life is understanding the nature of killing. You know that something other some animals eat other animals, and and other animals graze first, secondary things like that. If you don't understand that process and you start making decisions about how to manage nature, then you end up with kindness screwing it up and actually hurting something else and and the other thing about that is when you when you allow emotion to take over right you you there's been many times when you've they've had utter disasters where everything starves to death because you you can't save all animals from everything so the the predators come in and they start eating all the babies and you know, people don't think about that. You got predators, they're taking out the the weak, you know, all they're just taking out the weak and the 
well, well what's the weak? The weak are all the babies. So they'll come in and kill 90% of the babies and not even eat half of them just because they're easy to catch, you know, things like that. But if you don't understand that kind of stuff and you try to manage it like uh, on pure emotion, you're just causing a mess. Yeah. Another thing that concerns me, you know, a lot of common sense goes out the window. And I would ask a lot of these people who are in favor of, uh, you know, moving the livestock off of the, the grazing allotments and, and not allowing any grazing whatsoever, I would ask those same people, why in the world do you mow your lawn? Yeah. Why don't you just let it grow? Mm -hmm. Why do you mow it? Well, they mow it because they want it to thrive. <laughs> It grows better when you could right. chop it off. Yeah, if you yep. let that lawn just grow up and die and grow up and die, I mean, in two or three years, you're going to have weeds and dead spots. and so It I, actually starts coating the ground and yeah. making the ground un, unusable. and doesn't grow very good grass. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, that was really awesome, Bill. Thank you for that. I've just learned so much, Randy, in the last 20 25 years really especially when they when they kick those cattle out that's when you really saw it happen the learning yeah. began because all my years growing up on the ranch i just enjoyed all those critters thriving together you know like up in the muddy drainage which is just beyond these mountains we had the whole thing leased and private land in the bottom anyway there was about 300 head of elk that lived up in this one area and they calved in the same place every year. Well, it, it was right behind the cattle and we could count on it year after year. When I was a little kid, I always wanted to go with that because I wanted to go up and see those baby cows and those elk up there squealing and having fun, you know, in that gorgeous setting. And they would just follow the cattle around, you know, throughout the summer and fall. We always knew where they were going to be in hunting season. And, this story up here in the Middle Fork, I didn't want to use the name. Cause, right. You know, but that story is so tragic because I saw what heaven was like. When I bought that business, the magic was happening with the proper management and had been going on since they had sheep up there, mm -hmm. you know. But I'll have to say the Forest Service was doing a good job of managing the numbers they had about 350 cows up there, and they, they put them in about the 10th of June. And I think they'd stay maybe 30 days in each pasture. I even cowboyed that one time for the guys that had it. And they just move them up country, and then eventually out they'd come, like the 1st of October before hunting season hit. But just like clockwork, on about August 28th, there would be 350 elk come in out of Idaho, like a herd of buffalo. It was the most amazing thing to watch and witness. You've seen it. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd be squealing and whistling and raising hell and just like, here we go. You know, here comes the rut. Mm -hmm. They'd pile into that drainage. And by the time, you know, another 10 days was up, there'd be 700 elk in that drainage. Mm -hmm. And we had paradise for all of the right, or uh, the rut, you know. And the, the cattle were in there, the elk were in there, it was, and the mule deer and bears and mountain goats, and it was just unbelievable. I can remember so many times sitting up on those high ridges just thanking the good Lord that I had the opportunity to witness what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. Because everything was just thriving, you know. And we, of course, you know, we were managed by the Forest Service. We could only take X amount of hunters in there based on the days that we had. And so we were taking, a, you know, X amount of elk and deer out. But it seemed like about the right amount of, uh, because every year, you know, you'd have the the new cows and new bulls. and But anyway, then about 95-ish, they decided that the cows were destroying the habitat and out they yep. went. And, and it's become a lot more difficult to run cows on oh. Forest Service service since then. Ever yeah. since that, the change, the shift happened, it was just a difference in, it seems like it's a difference in, uh, you know, they started hiring, a lot more people got into the Forest Service it, that are coming, and now it's pretty much all of them. Most of the people that come into the Forest Service now are not people who are raised here like it, 
with the responsibility right. of this environment. They're, they come out of school somewhere because they want to get involved in that lifestyle. I don't blame them for that. But they don't have the practical knowledge. Precisely. They, yeah, they got the you know the bio, biology knowledge and yeah. and then whatever your college had. Sometimes it's a very activist thought process. And it's a little bit agenda driven. I'll give you a perfect example. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when I was outfitting up there, the Outfitters and Guides Association used to host a big uh, meeting with the Forest Service supervisors and all the managers and everything, and it was a wonderful event really productive and those people got along really well and they learned a lot from each other so it was a great thing and i hosted it one time on behalf of the outfitters and guides association and, and they were discussing grazing and you know everything that affected recreation and livestock and the resource in general and they had a guy from the forest service who i sure was a biologist you know mm -hmm. specializing in grazing and he was given a presentation and there was probably 12 outfitters there and about as many Forest Service supervisors and whatnot. And he literally looked everybody in the eye and he said, it's a well-known fact that buffalo never, ever were above or grazed above 4,500 feet of elevation. Huh? And I stood there and listened to that guy. And I knew that every single house in Lima had a buffalo skull in it that had been pulled out of that spring, right? Well, yeah, right exactly. by the Continental Divide. Mm-hmm. I mean, that place was loaded with buffalo, and Lima's at 6,300 feet. Right. So, <laughs> so I, you've got a guy that's in charge or is influencing the managing process that, that says that it's a bona fide truth that buffalo never went above 4,500 feet. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Well, I think we deal with a lot of, we deal with so many facts nowadays that are, are insanely impractical and untrue if you actually live out here right in society in schools and you know lots of things you learn in school are based on facts that aren't facts at all they're just right. somebody has believed them for long enough that hasn't actually lived the life right it, it so if this guy that i was referring to if he'd have been raised in lima and had pulled two or three skulls out of that spring that sits at 8,000 feet and mm -hmm. then gone to college and somebody would have tried to tell him, oh, they never went above 4,500 feet. He'd be like, there's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> He'd be like, I think you're wrong. <laughs> but instead, because you haven't, don't have that experience, they just take what you learn in school. And there's a big difference between what comes out of a book and practical knowledge. In many cases, just look at engineering for one thing. You know, engineering, you can learn all the all the book smarts you want, but unless you have practical knowledge of how mechanics work in the real world, some of some of what works on paper will not work in the real world, or at least not the way you think it's going to. <laughs> Same thing with this. Yeah, and a lot of these old timers out here, you know, speaking of engineering, you know, that 78 Ford truck I was telling you about, you could chain that old girl up and climb a telephone pole if you needed to, right? Oh, yeah. So, you know, sometimes you can buy these newer vehicles and if you ever try to put a set of chains on them, big heavy chains. Yeah, be really careful. And you yeah, but you can't turn the wheel. Because mm -mm. if you do, it'll tear your fender up. Or your brake line out or, <laughs> right. or a, something else out. You gotta be very careful how you put them on there. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a little bit of a breakdown in terms of the real world, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of engineering as uh it's evolved to the point where they're kind of forgetting some of the more practical applications of four-wheel drive. <laughs> well, and I think that applies to everything we're talking about, too. Oh, yeah. It's practical knowledge versus book knowledge. And a lot of times, book knowledge is missing some of the things that the practical people, the people who live with it every right. day and understand it, it's not in the book. But it's it's been in there so long, you get it in there so long, and then all of a sudden it's it's a fact. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm your host, Trinity Vandenacre on the Life in the West podcast, and you are listening to Trinity and Bill Briggs just have a conversation with each other down in Lima, Montana about some old-time ranch and stuff and just realities of life that people may or may not understand in, the, in this modern world, especially if you live in a city or away from the agriculture. So thanks for listening in. Until next time, God bless.